We've got some extraordinary judges tonight. I'm so proud <laughs> to tell you about them. And I'm going to ask them each to rise and receive your applause as they are announced. First of all, we have Barbara. Barbara, I said, Barbara, what qualifies you to be a judge? And she replied, and I quote, absolutely nothing. <laughs> Next, we have Peter. Where are you, Peter? Yes. <laughs> Peter, I said, what qualifies you to be a judge? And he replied, and I quote directly, absolutely nothing. <laughs> now, I don't know whether he overheard Barbara and just thought, well, I don't have to think up my own qualifications. I'll use hers. Imposter. Anyway, that's Peter. We got Mackenzie. Where are you, Mackenzie? <laughs> when asked what qualifies her to be a judge, Mackenzie responded, and I quote directly, I don't know. <laughs> we got Bob. Where are you, Bob? What a sport. <laughs> Bob is qualified. Huh. Well, I asked him, what qualifies you, Bob? And he said, and I quote, I don't think I'm qualified. <laughs> I said, that makes you an ideal judge. And he agreed. And finally, we've got Aaron. Where are you, Aaron? Aaron, I said, you know what I said to her, don't you? What did I say? What do you I think no I said? <laughs> what qualifies you to be a judge? And she, she had the answer of the evening. I think she really is our most qualified judge. She said, what qualifies me to be a judge? I don't know. A lot of spoken word? Oh. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, sure. Sure. Well, those of you who don't know the rules of Poetry Slam, I have brought along the Bible of Poetry Slam so that I can read to you the official rules for Poetry Slam. The Bible of Poetry Slam, Hewitt's Guide, make sure that the television camera gets it, Hewitt's Guide to Slam Poetry and Poetry Slam. It looks wow. like yeah. you too. It looks like it you. Is. Oh my gosh. You should be a judge. Whoa, looks like me. Come on. Oh man, look at the belly on that guy. Does that look like me? Come on. The poet shall perform original work only without props, costumes, Original. Or musical that accompaniment. Means? It means that the poet has to, the slammer has to be the author of the work. What? I'm not, I don't have any. Are you signed up to slam? Yeah. So we'll disqualify you after you do it. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're celebrating. Oh, all this nervous. We are celebrating well, poetry. You just won't get a prize. <laughs> I'm but, nervous then. Oh, man. The, poem, the poet shall perform original work only without props, costumes, or musical accompaniment within three minutes, but with a 10 second grace period in front of five judges who will score the work in a range of zero to 10 with decimal points to one place. And the highest and the lowest of those scores discarded. And all poets tonight proceeding to a slam off a second round. The scores will be totaled to determine tonight's slam champion. There are prizes for the four highest scoring slammers, and those prizes are on this bench here. And for all of the rest of the people who slam tonight, we have booby prizes, actually some very fine books. So if you slam tonight at the end of the evening, feel free to come up and help yourself to a book. Yeah. Judges, please stand and raise your right hand. <laughs>
Repeat after me. I, I, I hereby affirm. Hereby oh, start over. I, I, I fill in your name. Do you hereby affirm <laughs> that I shall remain objective throughout the slam? Not giving unnecessarily high scores to my sweethearts or those who I wish would become my sweetheart. Nor giving nasty and low scores to those for whom I hold disdain. I further understand that I have a set of scorecards lovingly photocopied from Hewitt Sky to Slam Poetry and Poetry Slam, which is on sale from the back of his car immediately after tonight's performance. And that I shall. And that I shall use a decimal point because that helps to avoid ties. These scorecards are precious. I shall return them to Jeff at the end of the slam. Give it up for these extraordinary gentlemen. Now, Slammers, an important announcement. Your opportunity to be famous is only moments away because the extraordinary people at the Orca local cable television station are going to broadcast tonight's event. If you do not want that opportunity to become famous, you must announce at the beginning of your performance, this is not for Orca. <laughs> Every slam has a sacrificial poet, that person who gives of him or herself so that the judges can warm up and set their standard. A very important role with no promise of reward. I've looked high and low and have decided that tonight I shall be that person. Your sacrifice! Oh, yes. Thank you. It's so good to have people helping out. <laughs> so I'm writing this epic that will change the world, should I decide to make it public, when this crow flies overhead and seems to hover, which is something I've never seen, inches from my upturned face before lifting its black bulk back to the sky. So I go back to the epic when this car, a green 48 Buick convertible with the top down, pulls into my yard and three men in long coats jump out and call across the yard, are you Jeff Hewitt? I tell them no, and they jump back into the Buick and roar off. I never see them again. <laughs> So I return to my epic poem that will change the world, and I feel my attentions shift like a quick jolt in the Earth's rotation. It's like this indescribable, what are you doing, of the insides of one's body, bones, guts, even skin and brain, asking, what are you doing? And I'm thinking about priorities. A chocolate would taste pretty good about now. I've been through a lot, you know. Seen a lot of strange things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Now, judges, you don't have a lot of time. This will be the longest space of time you will have for your deliberations. It needs to be from the gut, quickly held up your scores on the count of three, never before the count of three. We want the surprise element. Oh, one, two, three. Let me see. I've got a 10, another 10, another 10, another. I'm <laughs> I have a 1.1. <laughs> oh, no, there we go. That's a 1.0. No, 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 no. Oh my gosh, I know what he's doing. I have a 3.8. Really? Are you sure you don't have those reversed? <laughs> I can talk with him anything, right? I have a 7.6, a 7.9, an 8.0. Was it a 3.8 or an 8.3? 8.3 and a perfect 10, 12, kind of, and an 8, 8, 6. A 24.2 for your champion, poet. <laughs> Please keep it going. Here he is. Wait no longer. It's Ben. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. How long do I have? Uh, two minutes and 58 seconds. <laughs> I have two related sonnets, but I will bend to the Hewitt Guide, and even though they should be read together, I will do them your way. <laughs> I like and without that. a mic. That's fine. These two sonnets are about symbiosis, the art of living together, one thing depending on another. There are two cosmologies. There is the world we live in, but the other world is the hind gut of a termite. And I need to just explain without charging against my time. Oh, no, 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 your time is running. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I can do a line in six seconds. So let's. A termite cannot eat wood except it has little creatures in its hindgut called productists. They cannot live if they are exposed to oxygen, and they love wood. So there is a symbiosis between these little critters in the hindgut of the termite and the termite itself. So the first sonnet is going to be about that symbiosis. The second one on my second exposure, will be about the larger world. Enough. The hindgut of a termite is our world. Its darkened dome our skies. No polar star directs our way through seas that roll on far <coughs> from any shore. Against the tide, we've hurled our simple nucleated selves. To probe the great beyond is what we do not dare. We much prefer a little wood to air. Just call us Calonymphid Xenophobe. <laughs> no us, Reticula termes gets no meal. For cellulose without our help is dust. So if you weigh the benefits and costs, you'll see we pay the rent. No paltry deal. All life is merger. None survives alone. Take heed. The cell you lose may be your own. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Judges on a count of three. One, two, one, two, three. Let me see them. Ooh. Right, now, for audience, you know, your job is to try to influence the judges. If you don't like the score, what are you going to do? Vote. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's a score for you, just to try it out in case you don't like this score 5.0. Boo. <laughs> A real meaning. A 1.9? Oh. That's not reversed? 
training was done, race time was approaching, and the start of the run. But wait, there are still preparations to make. Wrong choices could be a real bad mistake. My mind starts to worry after a night of poor sleep. What to take with me? What the support crew should keep? These shoes or those shoes? How many shirt layers? Which socks to wear? Should I bring extra pairs? A rain jacket, sunglasses, sunscreen, a hat? Do I really need these things and those things and that? My insides are churning. My nerves are on edge. All bets on my race, I'm beginning to hedge. I'll soon find out it doesn't really matter. Runners share excuses and pre-rates run chatter. Didn't train like I meant to. Didn't do a long run. Didn't heat train. Don't do well in the hot sun. I'm loaded with carbs and last night, some beer. To get a fast time is not why I'm here. I'll run as I feel. Don't care how I do. Gonna run easy. How about you? I was thinking to run to get a fast and qualifier. But this cough's holding on. I'll run easy too. Then we're off. The crowd in a roar, excuses and promises, we keep them no more. Our cautions and stories ground up in the dust. As in life, we all run our way, race the way that we must. Yeah. <laughs> Out of three. Wood, two, three. Hold them up. I have a four. Oh, it looked like a 4.9 at me. A 5.7 from the meanie. No. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> a 7.5, another 7.5, an 8.1, an 8.9, and a 9.4, a 24. Point five five four two fifty twenty four point five for Newton. Well, let's hear it now. If you don't like the po the po the score that is given, if you think it's too high or if you think it's too low, what are you gonna do? Oh yeah. Let me hear. It. Yay. Yay. No, you don't <laughs> like the score. It's too high. Oh, it's too low. Too low. Too low. I need that dissent in order to fire up these judges. Otherwise, they'll sleep on us. Oh. And we don't like judges who are sleeping. Please, welcome to the stage, none other than Anne. I want to introduce myself. I am the meadow, the mud, 
the early blossoms of red osier, the cattails, the red-winged blackbird, the breeze that bends the willowed grasses, and the emerging spring that buds within me. I am the marsh, the glow of aspen, bronze green birch, lush of sunlight grasses in the far distant hills. I am dark jade pines casting silent shadows and tawny reds and orange of fenland reeds. I am the gagoon, lagoon, lagoon of the bullfrog, hookery, of the blackbirds, swamp sparrow's sweet whistle. <laughs> Still not. <laughs> the raven's guttural croak, 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 croak. Mm -hmm. I am the rustle of a breeze. <laughs> <laughs> Stirring golden auburn leaves in the afternoon light that touches meadow rushes. I am the red squirrel high in the ash tree. <laughs> I am scolding raccoons, stalking a bowl, mud turtle on a log, ooze and sucking mud fills my nostrils. <laughs> I am sky blue that inverts to a stream where reflections deepen into deep places, where I might have been, or maybe I will go. Judges on the count of three. One, two, three. Let me see them. I have a slow poke to deal with. The guy who messes everything up and puts them in reverse order. He's checking now very carefully. I have a 6.9. Oh. 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 I have an 8.0 an 8.1, an 8.5, a 9.1, and a 9.6, a 25.7 for him. Wait no longer, it's John Quincy Adams. Oh. I didn't even notice I was next. That's good. <clears throat> so, Dark. <coughs> Dre, are you? We're holding up for others. For fish and rivers swimming free so slow, I've never wavering listened for this will fly. I've never listening waver for they will know. We see the songs, we see the river flow. As wrens over the village flying high, we hear them winging, hear them singing low. We see the feathers falling as they fly. The weather never shows them hail or snow. For when will you sing songs of winging wrens? If you will never listen, then well, how? How will you know for singing well of them? Will you slow yourself enough for hearing now? I wish for summer's seasons here with you. Will you unfill yourself for me anew? On account of three judges, one, oh, Bob, I'm going to make this a long count. One and a half, <laughs> one and three quarters. He's getting his right hand and his left hand coordinated. Yeah, Two. And two and a half, two and three quarters. <laughs> Hold them up! We have a 6.4, a 6.4. A 6 Wow, this is 
an amazing audience, a 7.1, a 7.6, a 9.1, and a 9.4. A 23.8 for John Cusiano. recite anything and I thought it had to be done without reading it by memory. So my poem is from Robert Frost. It's called A Tuft of Flowers. I went to turn the grass once after one who mowed it in the dew before the sun. The sun was gone that made his blade so keen before I came to view the level scene. I looked for him behind an aisle of trees. I listened for his whetstone on the breeze. But he had gone, the grass all mown, and I must be as he had been, alone. As all must be, I said within my heart, whether they uh, work together or apart. But as I said it, swift there passed me by a noiseless swing of bewildered butterfly. Seeking from memories grown dim or night, some resting flower of yesterday's delight. Once I marked his flight go round and round as where some flower lay withering on the ground. And then he flew as far as I could see and then on tremulous wing came back to me. I thought of questions that have no reply, and would have turned to toss the grass to dry. But he turned first, and led my eye to look at a tall tuft of flowers beside a brook. A leaping tongue of bloom the sigh had spared. Beside a reedy brook the sigh had bared. I left my place to know them by their name, Finding them butterfly weed when I came. The mower and the dew had loved them thus, leaving them to flourish, not for us, nor yet to draw one thought of ours to him, but from sheer morning gladness at the brim. The butterfly and I had lit upon, nevertheless, a message from the dawn that made me hear the wakening birds around and hear his long sigh whispering to the ground and feel a spirit kindred to my own so that henceforth I work no more alone but glad with him as if with his aid and weary sought at noon with him the shade and dreaming as it were held brotherly speech with one who thought I had not hoped to reach. All men work together, I told him from the heart, whether they work together or apart. Yeah, yeah. Where's my Kleenex? <laughs> On the count of three judges, one, two, Three, let me see them. Uh, one, two, three, uh, let me see them. Uh, six point one, boom! <laughs> An eight point zero, a nine point zero, and two perfect ten! <laughs> So Barbara moves into the lead with a 27.0. Diane, I, why did I call you Barbara? That's because you're a judge. I'm sorry about that. I didn't want to be. <laughs> she moves into the lead with a 27.0, and here's where the booing really starts because I need to disqualify Diane because it was not her own poem. That poem was written by Robert Frost, I could tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> However, 
was a consolation. Was a consolation for Diane. I shall offer because she had the first double ten score, two tens of the evening. You'll remember that I got ten, but I only got one. Not very good judging. <laughs> But since she got two, I shall perform a little cantata for her. <laughs> and you all will appreciate it. Yes. yes. Everybody ready? Is there such a word thing as a cantata without words? Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Good, because I didn't want to sing. I want to play my instrument. His words coming out full of orgasmic fire assured the world will also climax as if, there, as if there never has been anything like a pen before. And you know he is fooling himself, whether he's an angry young man in the throes of a ranch or an angry old professor with um, ten, under tenure pressure. It's all the same game, just a, tr this, just a slick trick of the mind, allowing artistic reiteration that thinks it's one of a kind. But so god-awful much of it is doomed from the start, no matter how he beats his drum or pours out his heart and stands as full of metaphors that desperately want to strike the right chord, but won't, can't, or just plain don't. That's just the way it goes. So much so that you want to find words to encourage him, show him support in the afterwards, or maybe even before then, at any point in time, really, when he is contemplating the poem he is about to create, or has almost created, or has created, and doesn't know if it really is his, or should be his, or deserves to be his. And if that even matters anyway, since it begins feeling already like the poem has a vulnerable life of its own, all full of its own secret person, purpose, and you can't help noticing how the poem looks like a woman going to the clinic seven days late and full of trepidation, or maybe several months late and full of something more solid, but in either case, wondering about the right she has and the right she maybe doesn't have. No decision she makes seeming to match the nagging doubts still peeking around her head as she rides there with the sterile walls and an ironic mockery in itself, closing her in the waiting room with other waiters, all of them thinking, this is it, I've made my decision, and she hears the muffled back and forth between a patient and the receptionist who remains patient as the person before her raises her voice and clutches her protruded stomach while highly self maneuver saying, I changed my mind again. I want it out. I want it gone. I want it to be done. But the woman of your imagination is not done. Instead, she is thinking about what has begun and if it should be undone. She is listening to the other noises, the vague clank of metal, and what sounds like scraping away the part that no one wants, but all the while wondering if that is ever wholly true or stays true. And if, in the aftermath, aftermath, no matter how many right decision pats on the back either by others, she won't be thinking of tissue, but instead find herself weeping from blue eyes that never was, that never saw, and a beginning that never became much beyond an initial fragile formation. With this in mind and full of good intent, you reach out a hand to touch the postpartum poet genuflecting by the shredder. His top already off, and in her confetti dances through disbelieving hands, literary ink mixing with literal tears, and you want to alleviate his sad fears. Tell him he will create another one, that he surely has inside him another one, but you know it won't be the same, can't be the same, not by a very long shot, and the best you can do under such circumstances is to keep silent. Here. Judges on the count of three. Mm -hmm. 
One, two, three, let me see them. I have a 6.2, a 6.7, an 8.3, a 9.3, and a 9.5! Here it is, 70.50, a 24.3 for JD! <laughs> I know the mic's not working, but I'm going to stand up here anyway. So if you stumble across wandering thoughts in time and baking traces of wine, don't pay it any mind. For you, it's just a lifetime that you're making. And if you see a sky full of stars, close your eyes and you're not so far, turn around and take the world away. It happens minute by minute and day by day. And try to find a place to rest, to warm my bones and soul, where love and life are gifts, not and tests, uh, where we take the worst of the best and the broke with the rich. And ain't it time to sever this segregation BS, all drinking out of the same cup of life, far away and dreaming. So now I uh, hear you breathing. Because uh, sending this out, uh, whispering your name, makes me do the craziest of things. I've seen the good, I've seen the bad from just about every side. But what keeps me here is my blackened butterfly. Its wings glide softly through the air, crashing like thunder silence that lets my heart ignite as fire in the darkness. And though you may find dizzying reels of rhyme, it means nothing in your mind. It's just a journey down the line, wherefore there are no fences facing. And if you followed me down the rabbit hole in my mind, an unlikely story you will find. But if you believe, if you dream, if you trust and have heart to love, you will never be left behind. Oh, we're having trouble, Peter. Are you okay there? I think so. All right, on the count of three, are you ready? I'm in the right. One, don't show me yet. I want to be surprised. One, two, three, let me see you. Oh, yeah. Wow. We have a 7.3, a 7.9, an 8.1, a 9.2, and a 9.3. Okay, Twenty-five point two for Lee. You know, people are forever coming up to me and saying, "You're such a good-looking guy." <laughs> <laughs> and you thought that was me on the cover. That you're such a good-looking guy. They say, and your body, ah, oh, extraordinary. Um, your poems, they, they feel as if they've just drifted down from heaven off the ink in God's pen. With all of that that you've got going for you, how is it that you can come up with the total scores at a poetry slam when there's decimal points and when you have to throw out the high and the low score? How do you do it? I make them up. <laughs> Finally, for round one, I want to hear it for George. <laughs> I could hear his hoofbeats pounding on the backside of the track. I could hear him winning because I was on his back. We were off the track down by the cow barn, and after a short um, unexpected stop, <laughs> we got back on and flew around and got rid of the cow flop. Soon the race was over, and suddenly we were there. But that was over 60 years ago, good old Barton Fair. 
you cannot be the winner. That's what the judges said. And when I asked them why or oh why, they smiled and said, you're dead. <laughs> I just could not believe it. And heaved a mournful sigh. And then I saw this brilliant light away up in the sky. I heard this voice a calling from that far off place. It matters not who the winner is, it's how you run the race. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> George, I'm going to give you a moment to put your feathers together because as the sacrificial poet, do I have a treat for the judges. We'll see whether we can get them to loosen up a little. This one really, oh, my time's already started. <laughs> So I'm tooling 89, Interstate 89, at the legal limit, 65, which happens, too, to be my age and feeling good. Bright sunshine and light western breeze, 80 degrees, early September, great cumulus like giant cotton swabs, the super rest temperapedic ultra queen topped and tufted mattresses of the angels floating like hallucinogenic harps in the arms of cherubs allowing the sun to shine through and last night's nearly full moon hanging pale in the western horizon. Man, I'm tooling and getting all these fabulous words down. At 65, I can still write, though messily, with the lines tilted diagonal up or down and sometimes crossing, but I gotta keep my eyes mainly on the interstate. At 65, one has to take care, like notice that blaring horn over my left shoulder. I guess he was trying to pass. So I jerked the wheel to get my Honda back into the right lane, and now he's completely parallel and peering into my eyes as I hold the pen below his line of vision and shrug into his upward, extended, full arm stretched across <laughs> the lap of his gorgeous passenger middle finger. I was wrong. My shrug only in flames and above the wind in my open window at 65, I can hear the anthem of anger, a one-word aria coming through as if anyone couldn't read the lips of scorn. Asshole. Keep on shrugging, but that guy cannot know, short of an international symbol as pervasive and recognized as the cliché of his flip-off, the all-but-routine giving of the bird, the flourishing of the finger, just a simple gesture, folks. Let's think hard and devise it some way to say without words, sorry, pal, I was writing. <laughs> <laughs> Judges on the count of three. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh. 
They were so taken with the poem, they forgot their numbers. Two? Two and a half? One. Two and three quarters? <coughs> oh. oh, I may say, um, I have an upside down 8.9. That's great. I've never seen that before. Uh, 6.8. Uh, uh, 8.9. I have an 8.6, an 8.8, an 8.9, and two perfect tens. Uh, uh, 17, 19, a 27.7 for your soccer. day. The best part of a first year in the first grade. I had heard the first grade rhythm band play before I went to school and thought that someday I would be on the same stage. And wouldn't that be cool? Grant had learned to play the drum by a fellow that fought in the Civil War and he was going to help me out. Who could ask for anything more? My first grade teacher brought out the big box filled with rhythm things and a drum. And I knew my finest time had finally come. I had not been doing very well in school. And working with phonics, I looked like a fool. When the teacher was explaining when two vowels go walking, the first says the talking, I was checking out my feet <laughs> to see if all my toes were in my stocking. But here was my chance to raise above the bottom to at least the middle when I did a drum roll or a paradiddle. The teacher started to hand out the instruments, and my heart leapt with joy. But it stopped leaping when the drum went to the best student boy. <laughs> but the teacher pulled out a triangle, and I held my breath, for I knew I could twinkle and move it, move, move it. But the teacher called my, the name of a kid who called out the addition facts while I was in the closet hiding. Now for the wood block and a suitable beater. This gives me the best, this was given to the best penman, a penman, a kid named Peter. The bells were given to a smart little pelter who knew that the president, president was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> the washboard was presented to one of the uh, brightest kids in the class. And the tambourine went to a smart little lass. <laughs> And now came the sticks, and lo and behold, I got one to rub and the other to hold. When they practiced, I never did tire, always trying to catch my stick on fire. <laughs> At the annual public performance, I got to be right down front, because I had this distinction of being the shortest little runt. <laughs> Later on, as the depression was void, my pa parents decided. <laughs> Later on, as the depression slid, 
My parents decided to have another kid. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know there's a lot of choices to be made there. On the count of three, one, two, three, let me see them. I've got, oh, right, I got some scores. A seven, a 6.3, boo, a 7.1, a 7.6, an 8.0 and a 9 point, ah, uh, you got a whole 9.3. Oh, okay. And then, there's one, seven, one, 14, one, 22.7 for George. <laughs> Which gives him a total of 49.0, and he's in the lead. <laughs> Angel's Kiss. I'm wise, but I'm not that old. I'm young, but I'm not so bold. I'm uh, been attacked from every side, only fighting to stay alive. Uh, I'm young, but I'm not high strung. I'm tough, but not tough enough. Uh, I've loved with all my heart and watched as it was torn apart. Uh, still, I'm fighting on just to be the only one. Uh, I'm sure of what's to come. I'm young, but not high strung. I'm hopeful, because I got this song. Uh, strong, but not made of brawn. I'm small, but not weak at all. Uh, I, if I fall on you, I can call. I'm fun, but I'm not that dumb. Uh, ready to go, because life's just begun. Had my share of scary times, so close that I almost died. It's no wonder at night I cry looking back. No question in mind, no wonder at night I cry, uh, wishing for you by my side. And then like coldest flame, you appeared on a silver lake. Just like the wind between my lips, gently I reach for an angel's kiss, uh, falling into timeless bliss. Uh, Cause you know I can't keep from slowly counting stars, make or break, it's all in who you are, yeah you know. I can't keep from slowly counting stars, make or break, it's all in who you are. Okay, judges, on the count of three. One, two. One, two, three. Show them to me. I got, yes, yes, I've got a. 7.4, a 7.8, an 8.0, a 9.2, and a 9.7. Zero, the 116, 25.0 for Lee. And Lee takes the lead. Please. Put your hands together, it's time for J.D. North um, by Southwest. Ah, oh, Christ, when did the road to Purdue University become so paved? Did I miss a memo, a leaflet, a constitutional amendment that would have given me better directions? Or maybe I just cannot read so well. The copy and tear stained map and 40 into social hieroglyphics foreign to me. 18 years old and already lost at sea, I watch in my hindsight mirror as my best friend takes a bite of an apple I can't taste. Don't want to taste, actually, mistaking me having an altogether different purpose as my desires surface. But still, I clutch the wheel like I'm in control and don't feel anything inside me. I see the sign saying 465 exit straight ahead, like an arrow going the wrong narrow way, I think. But I take it anyway, I always do. Sometimes you have to go a little south, after all, in order to fly north. And in 1987, even Anderson is no exception. The bypass wraps around Indianapolis 
like intestinal machinery and crafts us out onto I-65. Weren't there horses before machines? Wild hopes running, roaming free. Full of fever, I reach over to touch my best friend's knee, but instead I catch myself and turn the radio also on. So many stations, but all I get is static. My friend hands me a cassette saying, why don't you play this? I oblige, and the greedy tape deck takes it. Oh, how great it is to be inserting something somewhere. <laughs> Rush ushers Tom Sawyer in. I look in the back seat for Finn, but all I see is a backpack containing my paint-by-number SAT scores, promising the future is yours if you do what I if I do what I am told. But I grow old, I grow old, whether or not my trousers are rolled, and I want that goddamn brass ring. Oh, I don't mean bling. You can have that sort of thing. I mean the luxury to be me, to have that kind of clarity. But instead, I have a welcome packet and a half-filled casket as dumb and dumb or academic junk remind me I was sunk before I had a chance to swim. Over to my right, a deer crossing sign warns me to watch out. How odd, for the headlights are always on me, and I think I must be the only one frozen. Still, you can make good time going nowhere. Like ice, high school wore thin. It had been a motionless affair, yet locked in place I fell through where the poker face popped with rue. And oh, it was so irrelevant. All hail, holy Thomas Covenant. I was, I am, a blood guard beyond repair. With little worth protecting, the predetermined physics of my body only outwardly observing the laws of organic chemistry prevalent in the halls. But the need to heed the societal call to be a cookie cutter made engineering seem full of bittersweet butter. But I wonder. As they take us off the highway, they gas up at a red and yellow shell station, offering a free car wash to what the real catch is. My friend comes out of the washroom as, my tank all filled up, I pull the nozzle out, careful not to let it drip, and slip it back in the slot where it belongs, where it's supposed to go, the right hole being so very important, you know. Do you have to go, he asks. Things left unsaid, I shake my head and get behind the safety of the wheel, thinking, where in the world does someone like me have to go? Judges on the count of three. One, two, three. Let me see. Um, I have a 2.9. Oh, 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 oh. oh. I have an 8.0, a 7.6, an 8.0, an 8.1, an 8.8, .8, and a 9.29. <laughs> and 4.9 for JD. Qualified in round one, but super qualified to let us hear a poem. Give it up for Diane. I learned this poem when I lost my pet. This is by Robert Browning. Though she, whoever kind and true, kept stoutly step by step with you your whole long, gusty lifetime through. Be gone a while before. Be now a moment gone before. Doubt not. Soon, your loved one will be back with you. She has but turned a corner still. She pushes on with right goodwill. Through mire and marsh, by high and hill, that self-same upland hopeful way that you and she, through many a doubtful day, attempted still. She is not dead, this friend, not dead. But in the path we mortals tread, got some few trifling steps ahead and nearer to the end. So that you two, once past the bend, shall meet again as face to face this friend you fancy dead. Push gaily on, brave heart, the while. She loiters with a backward smile till, till you can overtake and strains her eyes to search her wake. Or, meowing as she sees you through the break, 
weights on a style. Judges, you know the routine on the count of three. Let's put a little variety into it. I'll, I'll count backwards. Three, two, one. Let me see it. Ooh, wow. Yes, an 8.3, a 9, another 9. A 9.1 and another 9.1, a 27.1 for Diana! <laughs> But ain't it great, you know, the highest scores of the evening so far. You know, it goes to show you that either Robert Frost had something or Diane has something, and I think, oh, oh God. Go, oh, Diane. Too bad, Too bad, Robert. But now, oh, yes. No, I've still got mine. I'm saving it as a souvenir. John Quincy Adams. Oh. We're doing this. Sit down. Should I read the banjo bit? Is there a banjo in here? I, I don't know. <laughs> can you, can you skip it without obviously losing anything else? I mean, there's, if we're going to skip the banjo bit, there's a lot of things we should skip. Oh. So. <laughs> Why don't you just read the banjo bit? And then now we'll be excited when you get to it. <laughs> we'll think, oh, it's the banjo bit. <laughs> um, yeah, this is all experimental. So if you could bear with me with the weirdness, that would that would Time soothe my feelings. <clears throat> I know not the form here I now choose to write down. Its name thunders not now in mine's verse and verse forms. It was really too strange for romantic slipknots. It fell down in cracks wide that eight poems hold. So odd now that such singing rings not in glad ears. But falls silent where go the days past, the lives lost. It's one, too. It's quick, slow, is not known in high halls. I deem this a sadness, cause I love its chant song. It sings me to thrill thought, to tell Nathan Burton of beat sickly beatniks. He'll learn quick its rhythmics. I loathe them to part with a beat so sick nasty, but amphithabrats are not such a bad switching. They sink a capete in a triplet dancing. Not waltzing per se, but a similar tripping in kind, but I love that so sweet and so wailing. The song of the banjo, the slip and the shuffle, but this is a form which is not so bombastic, but whispering tells us its tale of the dawning, of light that comes silent and falls off the darkness. Hear now the last shape, my words here will sing pain to form nameless. Therefore I call you the herp triple. Yay, triple herp derp! The kings call you heart liquor, boot kicker, fear not to tread here, for here find a hard way, a fast way to knock enemies down. Longing, yes, longing that they could sit still and well listen. They hear the swift march, and so they are vanquished and song glad. Their hearts drink the words they are drenched, soaked in. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Try it in Spanish. Uno, dos, tres. Dígame. All right, it worked pretty well. Maybe I should be in Spanish the whole time. A seven point five, an eight point four, a nine point two, a nine point four, and a nine point five. And he has a 50.8, and he moves into the lead. Yeah. Yeah. I want to hear it, Fran. From inside out, Alan's quilt covered two-dimensional body lies on the borrowed hospital bed. 
tucked between two windows in the southwest corner of a little house at Hall's Pond in Maine. Outside, ice-shrouded birches burst into morning light. Inside, sunlight leaks through the shade. The wood stove crackles. My son grapples with the silent pain of letting go. A single crow calls. Bronze leaves of an oak dance, spin, twirl on their twigs. <coughs> and parchment curls of a beach shiver and quiver incessantly, tied to the memory of green, trying to let go, trying to let go into the arms of Mother Earth. That was my son, um, February 4th. He died two days later. In Spanish and Japanese. <laughs> Tres, dos, uno, dígame! <laughs> it worked! I got it. A 7.9, an 8.3, a 9.3, a 9.5, and a perfect 10. Wow. Three is eight, and three is 11 carries a lot. 27.1 for Anne. <laughs> Looks like a 52.8, and she claims the lead. Yeah. It's getting exciting, though. Enjoying little things, enjoying little things in life leads you one day to look back and realize they were big things. Advice and correction. Mother was good at both. With her pushing a needle in and out across a hole to stitch up the sock she said could be saved after I had thrown it out. Or anticipating the voice level elevating from two boys too long indoors. Why don't you go pick blackberries? I'll bake you a pie. From the cupboard under the kitchen sink, armed with old berry baskets, licked clean of all but slashes of blueberry stain, Harold and I set out for the pasture. The bramble patch a sold-out stadium of little black berries cheering away clouds so sun might reflect glistening black bubble-wrapped balls of sweetness guarded by a silent army of claw-like talons ready to shred and rip-saw any intruder passing through the steamy sweet aroma, and daring to reach in to pluck the bounty. No sooner the baskets full than a boyish, boyish challenge. Let's see who can stuff a quart of berries in our mouth. <laughs> Chipmunk cheeks and mouths choke open, drizzle berry juice, spew mushed purple fruit pulp, blotch white t-shirts as our eyes bulge, and bellies heave with stifled laughter, gasps, gurgles, frantic fingers claw to free a hole to breathe, till safe at last in home, we barely buryless boys enter in and from the other room, mother calls, 
how to make out, we burst with laughter again and again and still. Here, here. Oh. Tres, dos, uno, dígame. <laughs> Why did I think of this earlier, huh? We have a slow poke. He's doing the best. Ooh, oh, wow. Oh. 8.3, 9.0, 9.3, another 9.3, and a perfect 10, a 27.6 for Newton. <laughs> A 52.1 for Newton total. Final slammer of the evening, barring a tie. Please <coughs> give it up for Ben. <laughs> Final slammer. I've never been called anything nicer than that. <laughs> <laughs> this is the second of two sonnets, they are a lot pair. The lesson of the first one was, or should have been, that a termite can't get along without the litter, little critters in its hindgut. The question this one asks is, can our planet get along without us? Protectors is the second sonnet. Chordata, vertebrata, mammalia, eutheria, Primate. Behold us, sapient hominids, with dominion over every creeping earthly creature. Union with our conscious kind is best. Our state remains unique through all the phyla. We alone can muse about the self and sing of what has been and will tomorrow bring. Can endosymbiosis rule us? Free of earthly bounds are we, Earth's masters, mere dumb symbionts of what is rightly ours? Not so, no more than one could scan the stars and doubt that sun revolves around our sphere. Let pure and endless light engulf our day. If Earth is ours, are we not here to stay? Here, here. Yeah. <laughs> Tres, dos, uno, dígame! <laughs> the guy's got 7.7, .7, and then he switches them like this. He thinks he includes me? No way. 8.2, 7.7, 8.2, 8.4, 9 9.3, and another 9.3, that's 9.16, a 25.9 for Ben, and he finishes up with a 52. Point zero. <laughs> so, offer your extraordinary applause, and they will come up in the reverse order to retrieve their prize. So we got a Lee is running up with a 50. No, John Quincy no, no, Adams no, no, is. No. But who's, who comes in fourth? Somebody oh, help me. Oh, it's, I didn't realize there were yeah. four JQA is the runner up. And then Ben comes in third. Newton comes in second and the winner of tonight's slam, none other than the extraordinary Anne.